All right. Does anybody have anything? Yeah, they wanted to ask about or talk about or anything else before? I, I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, at least I hope it's quick. Um, <clears throat> when we were talking yesterday and I asked you about the environments, you seem to feel very strongly that uh, you should work in the base environment. And I've been rolling it over in my head. And I'm just, uh, when I think about the mistakes that I've made and how I've screwed up environments and gotten conflicts and stuff like that, I was wondering why why you feel so strongly about that. Sure. I mean, we'll talk about it more when we kind of get to environments, but so because we haven't discussed them yet. But, um, you know, briefly, um, uh, you know, environments are basically separate folders with separate installations of, of Python and Python libraries and uh, so forth. Um, they're um, often used for kind of keeping separate projects separated with different sets of kind of dependencies or versions of Python or whatever. Um, and uh, they certainly have a role to play for advanced users. Um, I almost never use them. I mean, very, very occasionally use them, but um, my feeling is the most important thing is to be able to rapidly iterate and experiment. And I kind of want my projects to live together as a as a whole, as a bunch of things which all help each other and, and come together. So I don't like the idea of like, oh, I'm working on this project now, I go over there and everything's kind of new, you know? Um, so um, instead, um, I really like to get very fast and very good at um, just quickly just going rm minus rf mini forge and it's gone and run setup conda.sh and it's back and have a single script that if I need one, I normally don't even need a script. I'll just go member install minus C fast chan fast book and that installs everything that I need and I'll, I'll go. Um, so I, I kind of like never want to be in a situation where anything on my computer is, I don't really like it's working, but I don't know how I got to a point that it's working and I don't want to touch anything lest I undo that, <laughs> you know? Um, so I'm more in the kind of chaos monkey side of like, explode things from time to time intentionally and be really good at putting them back to where they were, I guess. Um, and yeah, so I, nowadays I um, never have problems basically with dependencies or weird things going on in Python or whatever. Cause I just, from time, you know, like probably every few weeks I'll just throw it away and clean install it just to try something out for teaching or whatever. And I always feel fine. You know, this morning I did use an environment because I specifically wanted to test something on a different version of Python. And I wanted to check that it would install into somebody's fresh new environment. And so I, I used it for that. Um, I think it's useful if you are like installing some library where they've done a poor job of keeping their dependencies up to date. So you need like Python 3.6 and sentence peeps 1.8 and I don't know old versions of things in which case you want to be able to go pip minus r requirements dot text and get all these exact versions of things um, but my approach is to um, for my for my projects is to not pin versions not pin dependencies I want to be I want anybody to be able to install my work into whatever they're doing and work with all their other pro programs that they're running and libraries that they're using without anything getting messed up. Um, unfortunately, not everybody works that way, but that's how I, you know, try to make other people's life easier. And so therefore any programs you use from me, you'll be able to install into your base environment without messing anything up or install into any environment without messing things up. Uh, and when, sorry, just a quick follow-up. Uh, yeah. If you're installing, um, if you're installing into like a new computer or whatever, uh, would you use, would you install FastBook or would you install FastAI? Um, it, you know, I would, it depends. I would just probably install FastBook because FastBook installs FastAI, which installs NumPy, Pandas, or the Matplotlib. It also installs Transformers. It also installs data sets. It also installs SentencePiece, you know, uh, or maybe it doesn't install SentencePiece. I think everything except SentencePiece yeah. maybe. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, there's no reason it shouldn't install sentence piece. I should fix that. Um, so it didn't yesterday. Yeah, it didn't yesterday. I was just remembering that. Um, 
So, Jeremy. Yeah. So, if if you're blowing blowing it away and you're basically using a new OS install as, as like people do with uh, environments, mm. what how are you keeping track of your things like RSA keys, etc.? How are you not blowing those away? Those are not part of a Conjure environment, right. so that's that's fine. They sit there in my home directory. It's just the that many forge directory or many con directory or anaconda directory, depending on what you're using. I just delete that. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Jeremy, um, uh, you talked about uninstalling always, right, in this base environment. So yesterday I was trying to, um, I messed up one of the dependencies. So what are the steps for uninstalling usually? Uh, I know so to uninstall, really... just go to your home directory and type rm minus rf memberforge. Only that is required. Okay, I, I tried that. that and, I uh, and then so. close your terminal and reopen it. Because I remember the other day, uh, she didn't do that step. And so it didn't install properly. Okay. Um, yeah, so like let me I'll, sh I'll share my screen and show you a quick trick. Um, yeah, so this is sorry, this is a little more advanced than normal, but that's that's okay. Um, so the the it, this is slightly confusing, but the fast book. Uh, pip, PyPy and Conda installer actually comes from a repo called Course 20. And it's here. Um, it doesn't really contain any code. Um, uh, it contains a few utils, but that's actually like search images being, but you know, th this has got nothing to do with what we're using it for. Um, something that returns an image of a cat. Um, but actually, the, the, the key thing is it's got a settings.any file, which contains a list of requirements. And so if I now put this up on PyPy and Conda, then if I say Conda install or Pipper install um, Fastbook, then that's one quick way of just getting all these. Um, or you could create a tiny little script that goes, you know, Conda install, and then with these things in it. Um, but yeah, you want some way to get yourself into the basics set up instantly. Oh, here we are. This is why it didn't give me sentence piece. Sentence piece only comes with pip. And that's because when I set this up, I didn't have fast chan. And so I didn't have sentence piece in Conda. So, okay. um, Jeremy, I think you've got a, you've got um, minimum Python there, 3.6, but I think fast AI uh, repo has 3.7 in. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's that's right. right. Which, which I suspect it probably overrides. But yeah, so here's a good. This is a good use of the the GitHub GUI, right? I want to just change it while I'm looking at it, and we're done. Um, cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. That was a good question, and you know, we'll, we'll at some point I'm sure we'll need to create an environment for something, and we'll talk more about that. Um, I guess like maybe something else just well, you know, since we are, as I said, this is a bit more advanced, and people can totally skip this. But um, just, I mean, it's probably worth understanding what Conda slash Mamba is and how it works, right? Um, so you remember, you know, remember the other day um, I typed which Python, um, and uh, and I saw that I'm getting that Python is coming from this directory. So like one obvious question is, well, how does why why is it coming from this directory? And um, the reason why it's coming from this directory <coughs> is let me just open up this a bit more so I can see more people. There we go. Um, is that um, Linux, I mean, and, and I shouldn't say Linux, you know, Bash and pretty much all shells, they, they use the concept of something called the path. And the path is the list of places to look for programs to run. Um, <coughs> and the path lives in something called an environment variable. And an environment variable is just like a Python variable, but it's a variable that lives in your shell. And you can, you can print them out. So the, instead of print in your shell, you type echo. And then an environment variable you know, normally if I just say echo something, it just prints it, right? So if I want to echo 
the contents of an environment variable, I have to put dollar before it. Dollar means this is a variable that I'm printing. And so the variable path, there it is, right? And so you can see that this is a, a string, a colon separated string. And in my colon separated string, there's something which is home J Howard member forge bin. And so that directory, if we take a look at it, contains lots of programs. And one of those programs is Pi Pi Python. Okay, so that's that's why it is when I type Python that um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, when I type Python, that's the Python that it runs. Um, so uh, here's a little trick. I want to type rich Python, and I'm so lazy I couldn't even be bothered typing Python. So if you remember, double double exclamation mark means the previous command. So that's going to be which Python. Um, so it's worth looking and seeing like, well, what is this Mamberforge directory? So the Mamberforge directory, for those of you that have kind of seen Unix type directories before, um, it, it contains a bin directory and an et cetera directory and a lib directory. And this is basically looks very similar to my, um, to my Ubuntu's root directory. And so basically, a, a, a you know, a Condor or Mamberforge or whatever root directory is kind of a copy of a, a Linux or, or even actually a Mac um, root directory. It contains very similar things, et cetera, um, user, um, so forth. Um, and what happens is that the thing that it puts into our bash RC, so remember our dot bash RC is a, the script that automatically gets run, this thing here. Basically, this is a little, it runs a little shell script that sets some environment variables. And one of the environment variables it sets, for example, is the path environment variable. And it adds this to path. Um, it does similar, something similar to kind of make all the libraries work as well. Um, and so we mentioned how you can create a totally separate you know, environment, it's a totally separate place you can work that has its own copy of Python and libraries and stuff. Um, the way you do that is you go mamba create minus n, give it a name, and then say, what do you want to have in it? So let's say, okay, I want to have Python in it. I don't normally like to have, um, oopsie daisy, um, I don't normally like to have the latest Python. So let's get something before 3.10. Uh, and I also want fast core in it. Um, so that's going to create, so you can go member create or condo create. Um, I actually already have that because I used it this morning, as I mentioned. So I'll remove that automatically and create a new one. And so that's going to um, set up a new uh, environment, which we will take a look at. So currently what it's doing is it's downloading from the internet a list of all of the Conda packages that are available um, from a channel called ConduForge, which is the main channel that Mamberforge uses. And it says, okay, I'm gonna install Python and Fastcore. To install those things, I'm gonna need these other things as well. That sounds fine. You'll see it's cached. So basically one of the nice things about Mamber and Conda is that it kind of saves the the archives that you've downloaded, it doesn't have to re-download them. Um, so I, as it now says, you can activate this environment by typing mamba activate temp or conda activate temp. Um, so that's changed my shell. If I now say which Python, it's getting it from this new place and it's getting it from the same place as before, home J Howard Mamba Forge, but it's now getting it from Ems temp and that's because this Mamberforge directory has a directory called envs. And that envs directory is a folder that contains each of those environments. And it's really interesting to see what's in them. Because look, it's yet another copy of the kind of things you would see in the root of a, of a Linux installation. So that's, that's why it works, right? It's basically yet another copy. So for example, we'll see that in Ems temp bin, 
is another copy of Python. So if I type Python, it's running that Python and it's got its own set of libraries. Um, so it's using those libraries. So it's, it, yeah, it's really neat. Um, and you can install compilers, you can install, you know, any binaries you like, you can install Rust, you know, separate copy of Jupyter, whatever. Um, you know, by the way, something that's quite neat, not as important as it used to be, but um, these are actually using something called hard links to, to, to create these. So they're actually not even separate copies. So it's like not even using disk space. So yeah, the whole thing is really quite nifty. Um, so yeah, so basically when you go activate, it's in fact, let's take a look at my path. It changes my path, see? So now this comes first Maybe in my we path. could look at hard links. So I find hard links quite useful for myself when I have a lot of data in a folder and I want to run something on this data from another place, I just create a hard link. So Do you create sim links or hard links? Because sure. normally you'd use sim links uh, for that. Yes, that's the, that's the word, that's the rogue expression. I create uh, soft links, yes. Soft -links. Sim links, yeah. Yeah, sim yeah, we will get yeah. to sim links. Um, let's wait until we kind of need them maybe, yeah. Um, yeah sure thing. Okay. So to go back to activating the base directory, I just type conda activate. And now I'm back in my oh, nice. main, main environment. Um, so yeah, hopefully that explains a little bit about what environments are um, and why you might use them. Um, you know, there's a, like a, um, there's a certain way of developing software, which is particularly common in the JavaScript world where you, you freeze the exact versions of everything at a particular point in time. Um, and so you end up with things like, um, you know, well, in, in the Ruby world, you end up with a gem.block file. In the Python world, you end up with a requirements.txt file. In the JavaScript world, you end up with your packages.json file. Um, you know, this is something that I would strongly recommend trying to avoid as a data scientist when you freeze particular version numbers. Um, it makes it almost impossible to, to mix and match things from different places. You know, this library from here and this thing from here. And, you know, you end up going into this huge complex ecosystem of Docker containers and, and you know, trying to find ways to make that all work is can get quite overwhelming and you can actually it can, you can actually entirely avoid it um, by just you know using a single base environment and keeping your libraries up to date and having good tests and knowing when a release has broken something and so forth you know this it's not always the way but this is my suggestion for you know rapid iteration data science is to is to do things this particular way. Um, all right, so then that's, we've got, um, we've got our own computer running and it's, it's nice to be able to use Python on your own computer because, you know, you can whip it out a laptop anywhere. You don't have to be on the, in, the internet. You don't have to start a server somewhere. It's, you know, it's nice to be able to quickly play with things. Um, and, you know, I think like ideally a large amount of the time you're not using the GPU because a large amount of the time, hopefully you're like exploring results or you're testing out things in really small samples that don't need a GPU or, you know, hopefully you can do a lot of stuff on your computer. Um, at some point you need a GPU. Um, and my view is that you should try to use a GPU in a way that feels as much like your computer as possible, um, but doesn't cost you much, if any, money. Um, so um, at the moment, my view is by far the best option for that is um, uh, Paperspace. Paperspace is actually a company that have a few different products, and specifically it's a product called Gradient. Um, Gradient is, um, uh, in fact, specifically, it's Gradient Notebooks. So let's keep going deeper, Gradient Notebooks. So Gradient Notebooks is basically something where 
you can get a, a free GPU server, um, which behaves a lot like what we've just been working with. You know, you'll get a terminal and all that stuff. Um, so let me sign in. Okay, um, so Paperspace has this concept of projects. I have no idea what they're useful for. I just have one project, so I'll just go ahead and click on it. Um, they're just, they're the things that contain your, they call them notebooks, but these are basically servers, right? These are some servers. Um, now I, uh, there's a few um, options for like paying their money. Um, and if you can afford it, you know, this is such a good deal, the $8 a month. Um, not only because as you'll see, you get some pretty good GPU options um, and you can keep things private, but you also get more persistent storage. Um, so that means you can store things <clears throat> between sessions. Now, the reason this is really important is because these aren't actually my servers. Paperspace has not put aside servers for me to use. These are um, kind of, um, small little saved snapshots, basically. Um, and it's gonna kind of create a new computer each time I fire one of these up. Um, and so it's really nice that as you go from, you know, instance to instance to be able to access the same files each time. Um, so, Let's start from scratch because that's what we're doing. Okay, so it says select a runtime. Basically what this is going to do is it's just going to pre-populate your server with some files. And so if you choose the fast AI one, then you'll have the main stuff, you know, basically everything you need for the book pre-installed. Um, so let's do that. Um, and so, as you can see, there's various free options and various paid options. Um, so I'll use there. Um, so basically, you know, important things to know about is the how many, how big is the GPU? Um, these are all pretty good. Eight or sixteen is, is great. Sixteen is obviously better. Um, and then how fast is it? P uh, that that'll probably be a Pascal card. So that's a couple of generations old. Um, so it's like quite a lot slower than modern cards. RTX is totally up to date card. Um, but this one's got a lot more GPU. So I'm just gonna pick this one, six hours. So it's gonna, you know, if you're paying for it, make sure you've got auto shutdown set to something sane. Otherwise you'll end up paying for it for a long time. Um, you can easily share notebooks with other people by turning public access on, which is by default. There's a few advanced options here. I don't think we particularly need to touch them, to be honest. Um, one thing I'm just gonna note now is that it's gonna run a command called run.sh. So we'll just note that down because we're gonna check it out later. Um, and you'll also see it's actually going to clone a Git repo. So, I mean, one thing you could do is if you've got a fork of, the, of FastBook, then replace fast AI with your username and you're gonna get your, your forked version. Um, okay, so I'll start. So yeah, so I don't know, I find this a bit confusing that it says start notebook. It's, it's not a notebook, right? It's starting um, a server for us. And that server is gonna run uh, Jupyter Notebook automatically. Um, so the thing that appears here is the paper space GUI. Um, I don't love it, honestly. Um, so I don't really use it very much. Um, the one thing that you do particularly want it for though is to be able to stop your server when you're finished, um, especially if you're paying for it. But I mean, you should do it anyway because there's no point using their server hours. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just copy this URL and create a second tab and paste it 
just so that I've got two versions of that. So this one here is just going to be sitting here and I can go back to it and click stop later. Um, in fact, when I close this tab, it'll remind me that I have to click stop. So this is a good way to not accidentally um, forget to stop your server. Jeremy, yeah. that auto shutdown, uh, it happens if you're inactive or that would shut down regardless? It shuts down regardless, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, because that, you know, they don't really know if you're doing things. Um, they don't really have any telemetry or anything. Um, oh, by the way, this five hours seems to be truncated down. So it's actually 5.9 hours, you know. Um, that's just something I noticed. It's a bit of a bug, I guess. Um, yeah, so in five hours time, it's going to shut down regardless. You know, five and, you know, hours and 55 minutes time, it's going to shut down regardless. So the first thing I do actually is I click this button, which gives us proper Jupyter Lab. And then I don't have to use their slightly crummy GUI anymore. Um, and this is also nice because now we're going to be using something that's just like what we have on our computer, which is the goal. Okay, so here's Jupyter Lab, and um, you can see that the book is here. Um, and <clears throat> Yeah, this is basically the, the Git repo that we that was automatically filled in for us has been cloned into here. Um, just what I'm going to do is start a copy of an old machine as well. Um, not gradient. What am I doing? Gradient. Because I want to access some files from there. Start machine. Okay. So um, let's, I mean, so I guess to start with, we could go into clean, open up MNIST basics. So uh, let's see how much they've got installed, see if it's all ready to go. Let's try running this cell. Yep, there we go. It looks like it's got everything. Let's try running this cell. Nice. Okay, so it's basically got um, Fastbook installed and Sentence Piece installed. So that's good. Um, Sorry, Jeremy. Are yeah. we checking Jupyter Lab or are we checking the paper space? We are in paper space right now. See? Oh, so okay. just to remind Sorry, you, I, I clicked yes. on this yep. button. And that gives us Jupyter Lab sure. in paper space. Thank you. Sorry, I missed that. No, no problem. Uh, it's easy to miss things. Ask any time. Um, so one thing that is actually I find kind of confusing about Jupyter Lab is it has its own set of tabs and its own interface, and it kind of replicates things like that could be in a browser. So in, in a lot of ways, I kind of prefer the old version of Jupyter, Jupyter Classic, which you can always um, switch to. Um, but you know, I, you can get used to it. And one thing that helps a lot is if you just full screen this, right? Um, and kind of know the keyboard shortcuts. So control shift left and right square brackets switch between tabs. And that's the main one to know. Um, and control B turns on and off the sidebar. So this way, at least you can like get a nice you know, good juice of the screen, particularly when I click terminal. So if I click terminal here, that's not bad, right? I've got plenty of room to see my terminal. So that's nice. Okay. Um, so I don't... Um, Sorry, Jeremy, just, yeah. just on the bottom there, if you want to get rid of those tabs for any reason, there's that little switch that says simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They'll hide those tabs. Yeah, that actually gets rid of the tabs as well, um, uh, which I'm actually using the tabs. But yeah. what you can do is you can go remove status bar. It gives you a bit more room as well. Cool. Um, 
So yeah, now we're actually doing pretty well. And one particularly nice thing in Jupyter, by the way, is it actually has a graphical debugger, um, which, you know, so if we go for i in range 10 print i, and then we turn on the debugger with this little button here, and see we can turn this, we can put a breakpoint here on and off by just clicking. And so now if I run this cell, you'll see that it's got a breakpoint, which is very nice. And um, we can Got a lot of things in here, doesn't it? Why is oh, Steffi? Steffi. There we go. Music. What? Let's mute that one. Um, okay, so you can see like, here's I, and so if I now step through this, must be a better way to just show what we want. There you go. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's kind of a useful thing to have, I think. Um, yeah, I guess this would probably be easier if this is actually probably a really good place to not use import star because I don't see an obvious way to only add variables we want to the, to the deb debugger. So let's restart the kernel. Turn on the debugger. Okay, and then run the cell. There we go, that's much better. So now we can just see that variable changing. Um, you might be wondering why it is that I clearly am not very competent at using the graphical debugger, and that's because I don't use it myself. Um, because I actually really like the um, uh, the uh, non-graphical debugger, um, which I'll quickly show you. The non-graphical debugger you can use anywhere. Um, Jupyter it doesn't have to be Jupyter Lab; it can be in a terminal, or whatever. Um, but inside Jupyter, if you just put percent percent debug at the top of your cell, um, it runs the, the regular Python debugger, which is a, um, it's a REPL reboot of our print loop based debugger. Um, and you can type H for help to find out what you can do. And basically you can type just the first letter of any of these if they're um, unique by first letter. Um, you can see actually the ones which have a first letter. So C is short for continue, H is short for help, N is short for next. P is short for print. So the single letter ones are short for like the ones that you use all the time. And I always use the single letters because, you know, why wouldn't you? So for example, L, um, actually I'm not really in a file, so that <coughs> L won't work. Um, so let's try, for example, we can do N for next. So that just N goes to the next line. So here we are. So we've now gone into the the, you know, the code that we have in our cell. So we should now be able to, oh, next again. Well, this is really weird. Why is this not? It must be something to do with, I wonder if this is some weird Jupyter lab thing.
Yeah, okay. I think what happened was that because I had used the graphical debugger, it broke the normal debugger. Um, okay, so let's start again. So, um, so I hit N for next, and it's still not really working. Hmm. Okay, no worries. Let's switch to regular Jupyter because I know it'll work there. Okay, and there we are. Okay, percent percent debug for I in range ten. Print I. Hmm. How curious. What if I put this in a function? Would it help? Def function. Oh, okay. I don't know. I pretty much always debug things that are in functions, so that's what's going on. Okay, so so I create a little function. I put percent percent debug. I called the function. And then uh, the first thing I did is I type s. s steps into the current function. So this the, this is pointing at the thing it's about to run. So it's about to run the thing called define f. So we're now inside the definition of f. And now it's going to run something for i in range 10. So n is next. So n just advances one instruction. So now that I've done that, i should exist. So you can print the contents of something by pressing p, and then the thing you want to print. So i is now 0. And so then I can go next. And in fact, you don't even have to type n. If you just hit enter, it redoes the last thing you did. So that just jumps to the next line. And so I can p i. OK, now it's 1. And so you get the idea. So basically, um, and then I can type L to list the, the file that I'm currently at. Um, I can also see W to see like what called this, um, which it was actually called in this case by IPython or by Jupyter Notebook. Um, so this is how I always debug things. And I'm sure at some point we'll actually need to debug something um, I thought I'd just quickly show you that. Um, folks here who have used both the graphical and the reg regular Python debugger, do you have any preferences or anybody here that has just used one or the other and likes it, doesn't like it? I have only used the text debugger. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's wonderful, especially learning about you know doing the fast AI course you can just put set trace wherever you'd like and you are immediate, immediately transported there so for instance when working on a new uh, architecture we're implementing some architecture of I don't know my own idea or trying to re-implement something I create my own class and then uh, I can step through the shapes of the tensors it's just super useful yeah, so you mentioned set trace. So PDB stands for the Python debugger. Um, so set trace is very useful. It's how you set, oopsie daisy, it's how you set a breakpoint. It may seem like a weird play, way to set a breakpoint, but basically if we run this now, we don't even have to say percent percent debug, it jumps into the debugger immediately after that set trace call. So you can put that not only in your own um, Python files, but in Python files that you've installed from pip or conjure or whatever, and then step through it in the way we just talked about, and hit N and start running through and check the values of variables, whatever. Um, oh, I didn't say how to exit. Uh, to exit, you press Q for quit. 
if you are learning a new library, this is super useful because you just pull the library from GitHub, you do pip editable install, and then you literally can step into the code that you're reading about. So, uh, like, like Jeremy said, this is. And also, basically, every, pretty much every major programming language debugger works the same way. Um, so you can, um, yeah, if you're doing C code, there's a debugger called GDB that works the same way. If you're doing Perl code, the Perl debugger works the same way. They all have the same short keyboard shortcuts, the same way of working. So it's skills you can reuse. Um, and that's another thing, like in general, I like really try to avoid, you know, unless they're really, really good, but in general proprietary tools, I generally avoid instead try to use tools that I can use everywhere because then I don't have to learn as many things. I can learn a small number of things and reuse them all the time. And particularly these like really old tools like this, the way the Python debugger works goes back a long time even before Python existed. These tools have been developed over many years to get make them really perfect, you know, really to make them work really well um, by many people. And so they're very nicely optimized once you learn them. And they do take some time to learn. Um, but if you're doing these walkthroughs, then you're the kind of person who's prepared to put in that time. <laughs> so, so there's another thing related to what Jeremy just talked about. And uh, those are key bindings in uh, things like Tmax or even in Jupyter Notebook that we're looking at right now. So my normal uh, situation and what I would do a couple of years ago when I jumped into something new, oh, I would just uh, come up with my own unique key bindings that, hey, they will make life comfortable for Radek. They make it, you know, they're ergonomic and they're easy to uh, remember. But then as you switch to a new environment, you sort of have to bring the key bindings with you, which is a horrible pain. So just like Jeremy mentioned that he tries to use uh, software that is readily available. Uh, a way to shoot yourself in the foot would be to come up with your intricate key bindings. It's just uh, sometimes very useful to go with the key bindings that are already there. And I mean, and even more importantly, um, learning to use the keyboard for everything um, is a good idea. I tend to use the mouse a little bit for teaching because I want people to see what I'm doing, but in normal life, I hardly ever touch my mouse because um, I'm just zipping around. Uh, so yeah, there's a few tips. Okay. So, Jeremy, yeah. just, just a question, a slightly on a different topic, but mm -hmm. on the same thing. If if the library behind this uh, notebook has changed or get upgraded, how do we get the latest? That's what uh, we're going to do right now. So perfect okay, cool. segue. Okay. So let's say I want to um, upgrade something or install something in this environment, uh, in this on this paper space server. Now, you know, as we discussed, a paper space server is not really a server at all. And so, if I pip or conda install something, um, it's actually not going to be here next time I come here. Um, so that's a bit of a bummer. Um, so how do we fix that? Um, it's um, we're actually going to learn a lot in order to fix this. Uh, the first thing to know is that Paperspace has this idea of persistent storage. And specifically, there's a directory called slash storage, which contains your persistent storage. Um, and so as you can see, even though I only just created this server, you, you know, just now, there's, there's already things in here. And that's because that's my persistent storage. So um, this is, um, basically a mounted network drive. You can see all of the drives um, and how much room you've got in each one by using diff DF, which is disk free. And then if you remember minus H is the human eyes. It tells you sizes in, in like gigabytes and megabytes and stuff. Um, and so here's a list of all the disks that um, paper space has provided for me. Um, and so there's one called slash, which has got 168 gigabytes available. And here's my storage, which has got 496 gigabytes available. Um, so that, like, the, by default, the free for free you get five gig, um, 
which is still pretty good, right? But for eight bucks, you get 15 gig, which is a hell of a lot better. Um, not all of these are writable. So for example, they have actually a slash data sets thing mounted there for you, which is kind of cool because you can actually um, start using data sets that's used by fast AI straight away, which is pretty nice. Um, yeah, they're the main ones basically. Um, so what are we going to do about this, um, you know, slash storage? This is really where we want to install pip libraries or conda libraries too. Um, so let's, uh, I'm just trying to think, does anybody think of a pip library they want to install? Um, any favorite ones? Use something like auto pep eight or Jedi or something like that. Just it's you know doesn't doing really auto do much. Pep8. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> Jedi is already installed. Maybe we'll just grab the latest uh, version uh, of um of uh, of fast core. So. Yeah, okay. okay, so um so normally to install the latest version of something, um, so you can use pip or condo for for this actually for installing stuff kind of like locally the way we're describing it it's actually going to be easier to use pip than conda and um, so we're going to be so we use pip in in the in a past lesson i said like avoid pip um you know i think we're now actually at a point where we can talk about where it's okay to use pip so pip is um a perfectly good way to install things which just contain python code or which are kind of pretty self-contained um, you wouldn't normally want to pip install PyTorch because it requires like CUDA and stuff. And yeah, pip doesn't really have a way of installing those kind of libraries. That's why if you use pip to install PyTorch, you have to like separately install the NVIDIA software development kit. With Conda, you don't have to. Um, but for a library like FastCore, and in fact, honestly, most libraries, um, you know, that aren't like GPU kind of libraries, PIP's actually fine. Um, and so normally to upgrade uh, software with PIP, you would type PIP minus U, and then you type the thing that you want to upgrade. Um, or if you just want to install it, you do it without the minus U. There's an uh, um, extra flag you can use, which is minus minus user. And that's going to um, install it into your home directory. Um, and so there's lots of reasons you would want to do that. For example, if you don't have root access, um, or like in our case, we don't have the ability to like save the stuff in the root directory. So if I run that, um, oh, and of course I have to say install. Okay. So it's upgraded it from 1.4.2 to 1.4.3. So let's see if that actually worked. So Jeremy, why are you using, um, like is, is Mamba not an option for this? Yeah, so this is, this is it's, it's not a great option for installing stuff into a user directory. At least I'm less familiar with, with that. This is a way that I know is gonna work fine for, for this special situation where we wanna put stuff into our, um, into our home directory. Um, so yeah, M Mamba and Conda are kind of synonyms. Mamba is a faster way to do it, um, whereas pip is is a different thing altogether. And it has it's, it has this special thing I'm showing you right now, which is minus minus user. Um, and if Conda or Mamba has such a thing, I don't know about it and haven't learned how to use it yet. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, um, but at least for pip, this works fine. So if we now look at fast cores version, there we go. So it has in fact installed 1.4.3. Now, where did it put that? So, oops, here in our home directory, you can see it's actually created something called dot local. And dot local is where pip puts stuff that you install with dash dash user. Um, and as you can see, it's got various subdirectories and here is FastCore. So if we want to be able to continue to use the latest version of FastCore next time, we, we start this notebook server. 
um, we want this dot local directory to still be there, right? Um, so how do we do that? Um, well, what we can do is we can actually put that um, into our um, storage. So we could move that into our storage. Now, we've been, okay, that's all very well, but we've that's it's it's it it will now be in storage next time we come back. But uh, Python needs it to be here in our in our home directory. So what do we do? Well, what we have to do is we have to make it so that dot local in our home directory and dot local in our persistent storage are the same thing. And the way we do that is something with something Radic was mentioning before, which is using a sim link or a symbolic link. If I say ln for link and minus s for symbolic, and I say, what's the thing that you want to symbolically link? And I say it's slash storage slash dot local. That's the thing I just moved. Then you'll find that in this directory, um, oops, need A for hidden. There is now a dot local, but it looks special, it looks different. And it's like saying, oh, it's not a folder at all. It's actually just pointing at this other place. But it's like it really exists. I can ls it, for example. I can cd into it. And remember to say the last token from the previous line. Have I said this before? Is exclamation mark dollar. So that'll be dot local. You can see it does cd dot local. So yeah, it's basically like a, it's not a copy of it. It's like a shortcut into it. In fact, I think on Mac, they're called aliases and on Windows, they're called shortcuts. It's the same thing. It, um, and on Unix type things, it's called a, a sim link or a symbolic link. Um, so now if I run IPython again and check the version, yep, it's still 1.4.3. So it's still finding it. So this way um, we can actually um, make sure we've got, um, you know, that we can install and upgrade packages and still see them every time we launch, even if it's a new notebook server or relaunch an existing one or whatever. We just have to make sure that um, every time we start a new paper space instance that it, that it creates these, any sim links we want. And so paper space has this really um, nifty thing, which is you can create a file called .bash.local in storage and it will run that file every time you start a notebook. Um, and so you'll see, I've got a file there that goes through and creates a sim link to .ssh and to .local and to .git credentials and did a bunch of stuff that we haven't talked about all of them yet and .kaggle and sim links them all to slash storage. And so this way, um, every time I start a new computer, I'm going to have um, all that stuff um, set up automatically, um, which is, yeah, I think is pretty, which is pretty great. So that's how you can um, customize your paper space instance. So Jeremy, just to just to recap there, to make sure I've got that clear yeah. in my head and, and for everyone else too. So like essentially what you've done is that you've got this bash script that you keep inside your persistent storage, which contains all your config and bits and pieces that you want. And then um, every time you fire up a new <clears throat> a new instance, you're just sim linking all that stuff that you've got in storage to the to the machine you've just created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and 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 in particular, you know, after I type, you know pip install minus minus user something, it's created this dot local directory. So, and that's something that I want to be persistent. So I move that into storage and then sim link it back to where it's meant to be. Understood, thanks. And the reason that you're doing this is, is because you can't get access to the 
the root directory on their server? Like, would, would you need to do this on your own computer as I, well? I, no, this is just for paper space. It's not that I can't access it, Mark. I can, I can install it. But the problem is these are not real servers. That's not, that, that's not persisted. So if I, when I'm in five hours time when this shuts itself down and then I start up the server again, it's not there. Um, it's, it's a, um, it's a mock server. It looks like it's your own server, but it doesn't actually keep your changes. Um, so unless they're in this is necessary storage. only on virtual machines, but like on a on your own computer, you wouldn't. This is need not to only something. just. This is like just this one. This is just paper oh. space. Yeah, <laughs> okay. this is just for paper space, and we're spending time talking about paper space because it's so much better than any other option out there for for GPU servers. Like they're the only ones that have these nifty tricks. Um, yeah, on your own computer, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Um, and if you've got your own GPU, you, you certainly don't have to worry about it. But, you know, there are other notebook servers like Google Colab or whatever, but they don't have anything like this. So on Google Colab, you're going to have to like reinstall everything you need every time you start up a new notebook and, you know, you won't have any of this proper environment. Um, so yeah, as I, as I, you know, as you might've seen, even my SSH keys. Uh, sim linked here. So I'm always going to have my SSH keys anytime I create a new paper space instance. Um, so yeah, this is like a super convenient way to have a free GPU server whenever you want it, which I think is pretty amazing. Uh, Jeremy, a question. Hmm. I, I followed what you did in terms of installing, people installing the fast core, mm -hmm. but then when I use Python and try to import Fastcore, it throws an error. But when I do IPython and import Fastcore, it can find it. Does it? That's interesting. Sense? Do you want to share your screen and we could try to of course, see back that. To do that? I might have to stop sharing first. Let's see. OK, I stopped sharing. Should share now. Let me know, please. Before. We're not seeing. Oh, it yeah, yet. sorry. No, here it comes. Uh, I forgot to press share again. No problem. Okay, so, so let's have a look. So this is on paper space, and you went pip install, good, and you went. Python, oh, interesting. Okay, so um, great. So press Control D to exit from IPython, and and you can press it again or hit Enter. Um, you didn't actually have to press Y. See how it's in square brackets? That means it's a default. So you can just do uh -huh. it. Okay, so let's find out oh, what's going on. So type um, which Python. Ah, okay. So uh, uh, okay, and then type which IPython. I've got a strong suspicion. Try typing um, Python 3 instead of Python. So just type Python 3 or one word. Not which Python. Oh, yeah, Python I see. 3. Sure. Okay, now try importing fast core. Oh, actually, this. Mm, interesting. Let's see if I have the same problem on mine. So Python import fast core. Oh, I'm getting the same error on mine. Very interesting. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. Very well spotted. So this is exactly the kind of bug that I want us to have so we can learn how to hopefully fix it. Um, I wonder if, 
because I hardly ever just run Python and, and I've only recently started using pip install user um, because it's because of this paper space thing. Um, so I wonder if it's something specific to pip install user. So let's see if we can debug this. Um, actually, what's interesting is no module named FastCore is actually very interesting because that means it also doesn't have FastAI, which, yeah, okay. So the way um, Python finds modules is a very similar idea of how Bash finds executables. There's, there's a path, basically. Um, and so in Python, there's a module called sys, um, which is uh, where all kinds of things are stored. Um, and so if we go sys dot, there's a sys.path. Now this is not the, um, this is not the uh, bash path environment variable. This is a totally separate thing with a similar name, which is an all lowercase path, sys.path in Python. This is a list of places that Python will search for Python libraries. Um, now, if I, import fast core. Um, then you can see it's getting it from opt conda lib Python 3.7 site packages. And you can see that is in my sys.path. So that's how it's finding fast core. So why isn't Python finding it? Well, we could do the same thing. Um, sys.path. So that's interesting. So Python here is not including site packages, where else, whereas IPython is. So there's something, I guess, about how um, paper space have installed things, because I Pretty sure that's not what happens here. Let's try it. Python import sys sys dot path. Yeah, so here's site packages. Um, so let's see what happens if we site packages. So this is a this is like the normal place that pip and conda install things is into the site packages directory. Um, and yeah, I've never really looked into it because I've never had problems accessing it before. Oh, it's something to do with Debian puts things in dist packages. That's interesting. Site packages not in path. Um, Jeremy. Hey, why is this talking to me? Hang on a sec. 
Sorry. Oh, um, go on. Yes, sorry. Uh, no, I just, just when you were looking at those two parts, one was 3.7 and one was 3.9. I guess there were two different. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Is that true? Um, you mean here? 3.9? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and 3.7. Yeah. There you go. You're quite right. Thank you. Okay, so that'll be the reason. Um, which Python? Which IPython? Yes, okay. Yeah, all right. So it wasn't just a case of typing Python 3, it was a case of typing Python 3.9. There we go. Oh, still not there. Uh, oh, it's 3.7 that IPython is using, Python 3.7. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. That's exactly what it was. I don't know why they've got so many <laughs> Pythons installed. It seems a bit like overkill. Um, so the Python, the 3.9 here was the system Python, right? And the Python 3.9 was the Um corner. I mean, because we're on paper space, um, I think they were all, um, which Python? Which Python three? They're actually all the ones in Conda. So it's um, so paper space is installed. Conda is the root, and so none of these are the system Python actually. Um, okay. Yeah, paper space is a bit unusual in that they have us run as root, um, so things are a little bit confusing actually. Um, yeah, now as to why IPython is running 3.7, um, I'm actually not sure. Um, so something else that I do is, um, is I create a Git directory and uh, oopsie daisy, I create a git directory. Um, and then I git clone things into it using my SSH keys. Um, and then what I do, then what I do is I move the git directory into slash storage and then sim link it back. Um, and actually where I sim link it to, I don't actually sim link it to my um, home folder, I actually sim link it inside slash notebooks. And the reason for that is that um, that's where um, uh, that's where PaperSpace uses as the root of its Jupyter Lab. So actually, you can see here I've done it before because um, it's in slash storage, right? So you can see here's my my Git stuff, and so I actually think, you know, it's, I don't really want any of this stuff that they've get put, put in here for me. Um, so actually, maybe I should try deleting. In fact, let's try that. What happens if we, um, create a server and we make that get repo thing empty? Because that's really what I want. You've uploaded your SSH keys uh, into PaperSpace, right? Yeah, I've uploaded them and I've put them in slash storage and in my dot slash storage slash dot bash rc dot local, I sim link them into my home directory. Correct. Uh, I'm not entirely paranoid about such things. Yeah. You know, I, just, I mean, uh, if you were, if you were paranoid uh, really about like... such things, then create a separate SSH key pair just for this and put that in your GitHub. So then people, if somebody steals your SSH private key, the worst thing they could do is to get into your GitHub. That's so cool. I didn't think about that. Wonderful. We'll do that. Thank you. Um, all right. So what would happen? It's a bit overkill for notebooks at the moment. Let's delete some of these. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, but for me on paper space, um, you know, everything's kind of going into that slash storage. So I don't really care about deleting things. All right. So if I, will it let me delete this? Cause that's really what I want to do. So I press delete, it's still showing me this. I don't know if that's a default or if it's just an example. Well, I'm here. Uh, so I just want to mention yep, maybe, sorry, maybe I'm the only one. Um, I understand in principle what you're talking about with the SSH keys and importing them and everything, but uh, the details of the execution, if I'm the only one that's fine, I'll struggle with it. But, oh yeah, uh, no, let's, let's do that. I don't know Absolutely. that I can actually do it. Yeah, let's do it. I, I, that's, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, I'd, one thing I just want to do for my own interest is I'm just going to jump onto YouTube and see if anybody actually watches these live streams, because if they don't, I won't waste my time running them. Uh, four people watching them. Yeah, not sure it's worth it. Might just use Zoom in the future. Did you know your hands up, Radek, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you don't have to put your hand up. You can just talk. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, you know, some libraries, uh, the more exotic ones, like uh, I'm not sure, maybe Graphsvis, or the, the, they require you install something via app to install some library. Oh yeah, some let's talk about that as well. Great. Um, okay, so this thing has successfully started a new machine. Let's see if there's anything in it. So I was just starting a new machine when deleted the git repo thing. Yeah, okay, great. So this is actually just empty. This is actually probably what I would be more inclined to do. Although I expected to see my slash git there. Oh, wait. Okay, all right, here's an interesting problem. Um, that .bashrc.local file, it runs when you run a terminal. Um, so my git folder symlink didn't appear until I actually opened a terminal. And as soon as I did that, it appears. Um, and I probably hadn't noticed that before because I always run a terminal as soon as I start pretty much. Um, there is a way actually that what they actually run when you start a notebook, when you start a server is it actually runs this file run.sh, which we can't change, but um, it does actually have a pre run.sh file, which is if you put stuff in slash storage slash pre run.sh, it will run before Jupyter starts, which maybe is actually a better place for all the stuff I'm doing. Maybe that's what we should use instead of .bashrc.local because this only runs when you run a terminal. Yes, interesting. Let's try that. Actually, I'd forgotten. It looks like I have got local member stuff working as well. Maybe we can try that next time. Um, so, um, by the way, to look at the, the end of a file, you can just type tail. So if I go tail slash run.sh, um, there it is. So if I move dot bash rc dot, sorry, dot bash dot local to pre dash run dot sh. All right, let's try that.
So if we now create a new notebook, if you're wondering why it is, by the way, that paper space is so perfectly set up for everything to work really well, it's because I've basically been nagging the folks at paper space for the last four years about all these things. And, and actually it's just really in the last three months that they actually really started listening and they've, I told them, put this here, put this here, then it's going to be great. Um, so yeah, they actually, yeah, they've been really great, particularly recently at setting everything up exactly the way we need it. Okay. So delete that. And so I think, yeah, see, here's that command, slash run.sh. So I guess what you could do, by the way, is you could like put some different, like your own URL here, and it's going to like automatically put that in slash notebooks. And maybe you could even put a shell script then that comes from GitHub. I haven't really thought about that. Anyway. Okay. So uh, I think it was Mark that was asking, how would I actually get my .ssh keys? onto this machine. Um, the short, the, I think the easy way to do it would be to use um, the upload file feature in JupyterLab. Um, this is a really handy feature to know about. So you see this little button here, upload files. So you could click that and then you could go into your um, dot ssh folder and find the files you want to upload and upload them. Um, so for example, I do config um, and you can see here it appears. And so then if I open my terminal, there it is there, right? And then you could just move that to where you need it. Um, one tip with SSH keys, actually, in fact, let's do it from scratch because um, that's what I'm meant to be doing. Let's do it from scratch to make sure everything works. So I'm going to rm.ssh. Okay, so let's do it from scratch. Um, SSH keys actually have to have very exact permissions on them. If they're, if it's possible for anybody else to read or write your SSH keys, SSH will refuse to use them. Um, and so one way to actually see the correct permissions is to create some SSH keys. So I could go SSH dash key gen, enter, enter, enter. And then I can go ls minus la dot SSH. And so to remind you, we did just briefly see this the other day, uh, the permissions, uh, these three here tell you this user, which is root, can they read, write, and execute the file? So this user, so the root can read, write, and execute, the, this is the private key file. And it can also read, write, and execute the public, uh, sorry, read and write the public key file. These three here is what about everybody else? And this says everybody can read the public key file, but they can't do anything to the private key file. And then dot refers to the current directory. So the directory itself, only the root user can read, write, and execute the directory. The idea of executing a directory might sound weird. Um, it actually refers to seeing what is in a directory. They call executing a directory. So let's upload my keys. Okay, so there they are. Now they're going to be put into slash notebook slash git. So if I go cd dot ssh, and then I'll move slash notebooks slash git slash idrsa. Now if I hit tab again, it'll show me that there's multiple things starting with those letters. If I say star, that refers to everything starting with those letters. So I'm going to move all of those things into the current directory. So the current directory, remember, is dot. So dot slash. And so there they now are. And now they don't have the right permissions anymore. My private key is readable by everybody, which is no good. So to change permissions, 
we say ch mod change. I don't know why it's called mod rather than ch perm or something. Um, and we can say um, that the group and the user should not have read permissions. So the user and the group subtract read permissions on the private key. And then check again. Oh, I shouldn't have said user and group. Uh, I what I meant to say, <laughs> I just gave, removed permissions for myself to read it. Um, I meant should have said group and everybody, which I think is all. So Jeremy, the dashes, the first three dashes are for user, the next three dashes are for- uh, The first dash the last... is for directory or not directory, but the next three dashes, yeah, go on. The next three dashes are for user. Are for user, uh -huh. then next three dashes are for group, and the last three dashes are for everyone. That's correct. Okay, that's what we want. So now the user can read and write the private key and everybody, can, uh, the user can read and write the public key and everybody can read the public key. So we can test this by SSHing to github.com and github.com expects you to log in with the username git. So when you SSH before the at sign, you say the username to log in as, and by default, it uses your current username, which is root. I definitely can't log in to github.com as root github.com. Yes. Great. Hello, JPH. So it knows who I am, right? Because it, it, it knows who has my public key in that account. You've successfully authenticated. And then it closes it because you can't actually use a terminal on github.com. It's only used for, for Git, but you can see my, my key is working. Can I ask it? Wouldn't it be simpler, or am I missing something, to generate a new key in paper space rather than import it and then just give GitHub that new key? Um, maybe. I don't know. I'm just thinking with all these, with all these like changing, like with all these changing of permissions and stuff. Um, I, I'm going to say like, okay, so I. Obviously, I don't think so because I don't do it that way. Um, but if I think about why I don't do it that way, I, like some people do it your way. Um, your way is in many ways more correct in that you would have different public keys on github.com for every machine you're using. And if somebody like stole a machine, you could delete just that public key and that person now couldn't log in, but you could still log in and maybe that's more convenient or something. Um, it's a perfectly fine way to do it, Mark, honestly. Um, I don't like the mental overhead of having to think about having multiple keys and which is which. And cause like I've had a, Git, a GitHub account for quite a long time and probably used, I don't know, maybe a hundred different machines to access it. And I don't like the idea of having a hundred public keys and thinking where, where are they and should they still be there? But, yeah, I think it's fine either way. All right, so that was actually pretty intense today. Um, um, so for folks who, you know, are just getting started, there was nothing we used today, I don't think that we haven't learned how to use before, but it's tough using things that you've only just learned about. And so therefore, you know, it does need a lot of practice. Um, so if you're kind of new to this, um, then yeah, then like you probably want to rewatch the video and like also pepper me with questions next time <laughs> if you try things and and it doesn't work um, or you're not sure why we do it or, or whatever. All right, Jeremy, anything else before we, yep. Yeah, what about these uh, things you have to up to install? Uh, how oh. do you yeah. Them between okay. Like... Let's do that next time. Yeah. Let's yes. do that next time. Uh, I will put it on the forum. Thanks all. Nice to see you all. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.